Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Joining us for the second half of our show is Yuri Maltsev, professor of economics at Carthage College, who was once a top-ranking Russian economics advisor, helping implement President Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika reforms. Yuri, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It's very nice to be here. Yuri, you held senior positions in the Communist Party in the old Soviet Union before defecting to the U.S. in 1989. I asked you on the show to share some history with us. This is important because despite what's going on before our eyes in Venezuela, multiple polls indicate that a majority of millennials have a higher opinion of socialism than of capitalism. And this is also reflected in the tremendous outpouring of support from the young for a presidential candidate who openly avows socialism on the campaign trail. Take us back. Take us back to your youth and the story of your own family. Your grandfather was executed in 1939. How did your father survive given Stalin's directive to kill all the children of anyone labeled an enemy of the people? Yes, there was an infamous directive of 1935 with a self-descriptive title that apple and apple tree in which Stalin insisted that the whole family, the whole cluster, as he would say, of enemies should be taken out. And according to Alexander Yakovlev, who was the true, actually, architect of Perestroika, about 13 million children were killed mm-hmm. in just in a very short period from 1935 to 1942. How did your father survive? Well, my grandfather, he was the chief architect of Sochi. That's a, it's a beautiful resort town in the south of Russia. It's on the Black Sea. They had Olympics recently there, like three years ago. And he was taken at night, uh, like most people would be, about 4 o'clock in the morning. And my grandma, uh, God bless her, she uh, immediately took my father. And they just disappeared because she knew what will come next. She just took a train and went to Kazan, where she was from. And she kind of laid low and uh, was with her relatives. And so that saved them both, saved them both. Hmm. However, not for very long, because then when my, when my father applied to the medical institute, then they already figured out that he is a son of the enemy of the people, and he could only complete his education when Stalin was denounced. That's a very sad story how many lives, millions, tens of millions of lives were broken because of that. You grew up studying Marxism from the time you first entered the first grade. What was that like? <laughs> yes, uh, the, first, uh, the first graders uh, were already, uh, they would begin brainwashing even before in kindergartens. But in the first grade, I do still remember our textbooks, their textbook for the first grade, with Marx. And uh, Marx was, however, called Father Frost because they prohibited religion. You know that Marx called religion opium for the people. Mm-hmm. And because of that, they, well, they, during 1920s, 1930s, they murdered so many clerics, 900,000 of priests, of nuns, of uh, just religious people uh, were killed because they were considered to be social vermin. And then when they let the religion go back in 1942, because there was about 2 million defections from the Soviet army to Germans, and Stalin thought that he is losing the war, only then he he again kind of permitted churches, some churches, to open. However, the religions, all religions, uh, Russian Orthodox Church or Muslims or, or Jews, they were still directed by the special KGB Department of Religion. And they were fighting religion all, all of the time. Mm-hmm. That's why we didn't have Christmas. We had only New Year holiday. But instead of Santa Claus, the Bolsheviks, they invented something called Father Frost, who looked exactly like Karl Marx. <laughs> and so we had this, <laughs> we had this confusing textbook in which, in the beginning, they sh- show the picture of Marx, and then in the middle, the picture of Father Frost, and I was uh, spending some time trying to compare the two. In schools, many people in the West, they believed that education was superb in the Soviet Union. Uh, well, maybe it was good f- with, with some exact sciences, Other than that, it was not an education. It was brainwashing and propaganda. 
Did you have any doubts about the wisdom of socialism as a teenager? Well, both yes and no. I definitely didn't like what was going on around, because being born and raised in the in the family where my my father's father was murdered, when my mother she has Jewish blood in herself, and there is an anti-Semitic regime around. Yeah, the Jews were persecuted. The Jews couldn't go to university. A lot of other things like that. So I kind of didn't have any trust in the government that we had. From another hand. Because we didn't know much except socialism, I was all the time thinking about some kind of maybe humane socialism, social with human face and whatnot. And I was in this type of kind of mold until somebody gave me, when I was in university already, a road to serve them by Hayek. Mm. Yeah, and uh, it just took me only one night to read the book. Um, This book was on the hit list of the KGB. Just for reading the book, you could get eight years of prison. And if you if you pass it around, 12 years for dissemination. How did you manage to be selected to study Marxist political economy at Moscow State University? Oh, that was very um, was very competitive thing. I had like about 60 applicants per each spot. I'm from Kazan. I was born in Kazan, which was capital of Republic of Tatarstan, uh, which is in the middle of Russia. It's not south. And, it's not east, much east. It's about 200 miles from Moscow. And I, at first, I applied and became a student in Kazan State University. And then after a year, my family moved to Moscow, and so I was transferred to Moscow State University. And in Moscow State University, I managed to get into the best program they ever had, and the program was United States Studies. And first, I had history as my major, and then I changed it to history of economic thought and economic history after reading wrote to serve them. From university, you went on to do labor research at the USSR Council of Ministers. What was the role of the Council of Ministers in the Soviet system? Well, the Communist Party would provide so-called the general pattern of development. They had just vision, the vision. Then the implementation of this, of this deadly vision was assigned to the to the government, to the Soviet government, which the head of the Soviet government was chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR. And they had a lot of ministries. <laughs> For example, they don't have something, they would, uh, they would appoint a minister, create a ministry, and then this something should appear. I had a friend, a, a young, young woman that I dated. Her father was uh, appointed minister of vegetables because somebody told <laughs> told Brezhnev that there are no vegetables. Brezhnev didn't know about anything. And so he immediately created a ministry of vegetables and appointed her father as a minister of vegetables. And her father was uh, was very upset with that because how could he make vegetables to appear? Uh, that would be impossible unless you uh, have a regime change or something. Because under Stalin, if vegetables would not appear, he would be shot. So he was uh, very upset, but I remember other people were saying, don't be upset because uh, Mr. Brush will forget it very soon and already <laughs> forgotten. And this ministry was, was liquidated only by Gorbachev in 1987 because there was no, no vegetables. How did Soviet socialist economic planning generally work? It didn't. It didn't to the point of it was such a fantastic experiment in futility. It's just, uh, just amazing. For example... I have a friend, I had a friend who was in charge of planning of medical supplies to the Chelyabinsk district. Uh, it's um, Ural Mountains. And so what could she do? I mean, how, how many people will live there in 10 years? Nobody knows. What kind of diseases they would have? Again, you can make a guess. How much toothpaste you need? How much of, of the heart medicines <laughs> you, you should have? And then, because it's something called chain planning, then you also should plan how many kids should go to school who would be sons and daughters of people who are making this pharmaceutical uh, <laughs> pharmaceutical product. And then you need to know how many dentists should serve this population. And then, and then like that. And how many <laughs> how many police officers should be? This this is such a exercise in futility that Nikolai Fedorenko who was academician, one of the greatest bodies of Mr. Gorbachev, he calculated that you need 30 million 
computer years to have a balanced plan. <laughs> but as, uh, as it sounds funny, but I don't think that you can do it even with this, with this time frame. Mr. Gorbachev, he was kind of imbecile in this case. That was the first time I thought that there is nothing much behind this birthmark. <laughs> because when, when he said that, comrades, it's not the central planning which is failing. We just never had a good plan. <laughs> Major changes took place in the Soviet Union when Mikhail Gorbachev launched Perestroika in 1986. What was the goal of Perestroika, and what was your role in that program? Yes, the goal of Perestroika was not to do away with socialism. It was to reform socialism, to make it palatable to build something, as Gorbachev used to say all the time, socialism with a human face. And for me, as well as for many others, we kind of couldn't figure out what does it mean. I mean, what does it mean? Because socialism can only be enforced by crude force, by mass murder. It's not a coincidence that all socialist countries all over the world were practicing mass murder. And according to Rudy Rommel, um, the professor of demography in uh, University of Hawaii, about 200 million people were murdered by their own governments just in the course of the 20th century. In the Soviet Union, the socialist regime could only survive when they were killing people. And then they, um, Gorbachev, when he was talking again and again and again like a parrot about the humane face of socialism, then people became confused. On the good side, everybody stopped working. We had a joke at that time in Moscow that the CIA didn't know what's happening, or what Gorbachev was talking about. So they recruited James Bond and sent him to, to Moscow. And James is walking from one store to another with a little notebook and taking notes what's happening. And so he goes to a butcher shop and writing, uh, no meat. And then he goes to a bakery and writing there, no bread. Goes to the shoe store, no shoes. And there is a KGB officer following him. He looks over his shoulder he said, five years ago, you would be shot for doing that. And he writes in, no bullets. <laughs> when people realized that they ran out of bullets, then the whole thing collapsed. Because socialism, even from an economics point of view, it's nothing else but, but public slavery. Yuri, you defected to the West in 1989, the same year the Berlin Wall fell. How did you manage to do that? Uh, <laughs> all right. I'll tell you the real story, and you, you just think whether it's kind of can be broadcasted or not, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I went to Finland on a lecturing tour instead of actually the first deputy prime minister of the Soviet Union. And so I was doing his uh, itinerary. And I never planned to defect from Finland because Finland at that time was dominated by the Soviet Union. I would be just be returned back to Soviets and would get 12 years of hard labor in eastern Siberia. And uh, the good thing would be that nobody would spend their 12 years, they would die in three or four. And I was not kind of looking for this type of career change at all. <laughs> and so I was not planning to defect. But I had a kind of like a bad day. In the morning, I was interviewed by Swedish TV. And the lady said that, well, you were so critical to Gorbachev, but uh, we love him in Scandinavia. I said, well, if you love him, what if we'll sell him for a reasonable amount of sausage, of margarine, of washing detergent? But it didn't sound for her to be funny, and so she, she ended this interview. But when I returned to my hotel, I got a message called Pavlenko, who turned out to be an attaché in Soviet embassy. And he was uh, listening to that, and he was, uh, he was telling me that we'll talk in Moscow. So I had a little bit of aftertaste after this. And the same day, I had a, I had a speech in the Ministry of Finance. And after the speech, people were serving food, and I was thinking, I'll go and eat food, and, and I'll buy more what comrades want. And mm -hmm. I didn't tell you what comrades want. Before going to Finland, a lot of my colleagues would stop by my office and would ask me to bring uh, something, even to the point that I asked my secretary to take notes and to, to see who wants what. And then at the end of the day, I'm getting to my secretary and said, Lena, uh, so who wants what? And uh, she said, well, uh, women, they want mascara, lipstick, and men, she said, men, they want only one thing. And I knew what they want. They wanted condoms. And why did they want condoms? Because, because it was uh, AIDS scare at that time in the Soviet Union. And, and the Soviet government even was spreading rumors that AIDS was invented in Fort Detrick, Maryland to kill Soviets. So then I had this day, and then I thought, well, I, I will eat here, and then I 
some hard currency, Finnish marks, and, and get more of, of what, what the comrades wanted. Well, to make long story short, there was one gentleman who was still asking me questions, and he said, you're so critical to socialists, are you afraid of going back? And if I would say, no, I'm not, I probably would still be in Moscow, but I said, I do have other options. And he said, well, if you're looking for options, let's do something. And uh, I said, well, go ahead and do it. And the only thing he asked me was the hotel I am. And after I returned back home uh, to, to my hotel, there uh, was a message called Walden ASAP, ASAP. At that time, my English was even worse than today. And so I thought that some Persian or Iranian person is calling. So I called this, this phone number and he said, let's go to Sweden tomorrow morning. Wow. And I was kind of thinking, huh, Sweden? Why? Why Sweden? I wasn't thinking at all. And I looked my appointment book. I said, no way. I'm all booked. <laughs> and he, he said, so you cannot squeeze defection into your tight schedule. And then I realized what he's talking about. I looked my appointment book. I said, Friday. And he was laughing again, saying, Friday, why, why Friday is defection day? I said, because on Friday, I'm supposed to go back to Moscow. And so we met on Friday and kind of in a roundabout way, I went to northern, northern Finland, took a ferry boat to Sweden, and then I took overnight train from Mumia to Stockholm, walked into the U.S. Embassy. And Marine Guard, he said, okay, sir, political asylum, okay, sir, but embassy is closed, come back on Monday. And so I said, no way I'm leaving. Then I spent the, the whole summer being debriefed by all these intelligence services of the West, most of them not very intelligent. And then I ended up in JFK and in the Kennedy Airport in New York <laughs> and uh, working through customs. And um, the customs lady, she said, please open that. I had, I had a Soviet, uh, very unusually looking suitcase. And uh, so I opened that suitcase and there were boxes of condoms and lipstick and mascara and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and so she looked at my passport. She said, well, it looks like you're coming for good. I said, yes, because I had a Soviet diplomatic passport with a stamp refugee. And I, because I kind of looked at her inquiringly, she said, I wouldn't let you in for a weekend trip with this. <laughs> and, uh, and then she laughed and she said, uh, welcome to the United States. Yuri, what do you suppose makes Western intellectuals believe that socialism would work if only it were implemented by good people? Yes, uh, the same great Hayek, he wrote a wonderful essay, Intellectuals and Socialism, in which he is making the point, I think, that's difficult not to accept, that socialism provides intellectuals with a claim to power, because the whole idea of, of socialism is that, yes, they're masses, they're working masses, but there are some visionaries, and these visionaries, they know more, they are educated, and they can lead to the ultimate power for these visionaries. These visionaries, they're spewing social hatred all the time, the social envy. Lenin won, I think, his bloody 1917 revolution mostly because of his slogan, loot the looters, uh, because, the, I mean, Marx wrote expropriate expropriators, mm -hmm. he translated into Russian, loot the looters. Social envy is the same thing as, as right now is peddling to us by Mr. Sanders and, and many others. All over the world, it's so sweet to hate rich people. And that's what socialism is all about. Because intellectuals, for example, if you are a college professor, or if you are a writer, or if you are an artist, then you still, in many cases, you live much, your material standard of living is much lower than people who are making, I don't know, condoms or mouthwash or toilet paper, and they just cannot understand why. Why is this happening? That they know everything. But the people who are in business, they are living much better. And so socialists provide intellectuals this claim to power, that they are exclusive, that they are elites. I mean, look how, how right now all these elites are fighting an outsider, Mr. Trump. What is it about Western journalists that makes them so sympathetic to socialism? Well, journalists are part of this intellectual elite and very privileged part. That's, uh, I think, why it is. Besides that, journalism, I think, is heavily subsidized by the federal government. Because if you will look at, at the National Public Radio or PBS, you will see that government is paying for that, and they are setting already the plank on the market for information. When you have this, if you are in NBC or ABC or CNN or something like that, then you need to compete with this. And how you can compete? You can compete on the same level only. 
And that's why I think that exactly after 1967, I think that was the National Broadcasting Act was passed, then I think the culture war was already lost. Today, for example, I'm teaching in my college since 1991. At that time, I remember kids, students were way more conservative in a good, in a good sense than professors who mostly were kind of holdovers from 1960s. Today, unfortunately, you can see that young people are really brainwashed by high schools, by, by universities. Uh, I mean, this is completely obvious. I mean, safe rooms or whatever else, the, the harassment of, of speakers that they don't like. Uh, so these are the, the kind of the outcomes, I think, of one of these decisions to make of Johnson administration to, to do with uh, NPR and PBS and everything else, which are just spewing this anti-conservative hatred 24-7. Yuri, what advice do you have for young people who find socialism so alluring? Yes, well, I, I, I advise them to study, to study history, to study economics, to see that it's not working. We shouldn't be a pessimist. We should look at the future with optimism. <laughs> However, there is a Russian saying that actually pessimist is a better informed optimist. <laughs> So, but but um, a great Austrian economist, uh, Ludwig von Mises, he wrote an essay, Are We Historians of Decline? And I'm afraid we are today. However, he answers, and I completely agree with him, we should fight for liberty, because what else is? What is the opportunity cost of slavery? Many of my students, they are socialists when they're freshmen, but when they go to work, then I think the reason, the true kind of idea of reality is is knocking in. And uh, I think Winston Churchill summarized it the best way. He said, if you are 20 and you are not a socialist, you don't have a heart. But if you are 30 and still a socialist, you don't have a brain. <laughs> well, Yuri, that's a famous saying attributed to many people. I think it's my favorite to give it to Winston Churchill. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your story today. It's been some wonderful insights. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. That was Yuri Maltsev, professor of economics at Carthage College, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio Hour on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And while you're at it, take a look at realclearmarkets.com, my go-to place for diverse views on political economics. We'd like to thank our long-term sponsor, Old Boston Restorations, for their support. Old Boston is a boutique property management company in Boston South End. Visit them online at oldbostonrestorations.com. That wraps up our show for this week. Please join us next week, same time, same station, when we report from Freedom Fest. See you then. <laughs>